we will continue uh, the conversation today of business continuity planning, focusing on business continuity and risk mitigation. Linda has given us an excellent presentation about assessing impact and a case study, a real life case study, uh, based upon the survey that uh, probably resonates with most of the listeners in terms of how to set your business back on course uh, through a risk assessment analysis. Uh, I want to first of all start with framing the conversation. You know, so much of what we talk about when it comes to risk mitigation practically, um, things like scenario analysis, testing, and implementation, focuses on providing you tools that are quantitative. Uh, but really, if you step back in the context of the world in which you, we live today, this is never before a time for the values based leadership. What do I mean by that? It really is important for managers and entrepreneurs and even staff uh, to understand the importance of trust. Uh, most managers at this time of companies are concerned about whether or not uh, you'll have the ability uh, to meet a cash payment or whether or not uh, your runway for cash will last as long as you've planned. If customers will, will, will actually come back and also on the, on, the, on the demand side, from the standpoint of customers, Will the company be able to offer the same quality of products and services? Uh, and so values-based leadership through which we focus on trust, I think is a really good framing to understand the importance of business continuity and risk mitigation. A study was done by Edelman Trust, uh, the Edelman Trust Barometer for this year. And it's interesting in looking at the dimensions of trust, you can see it on the lower left-hand side there. Um, it's interesting that in the case of these institutions where you have businesses, you have NGOs, you have media, and you have government, no institution seen uh, had uh, a rating that was both uh, indicative of competence and ethics. Uh, and even business, uh, surprise, surprise uh, scored pretty well in terms of competence, but in terms of ethics, uh, not so much. And so we want to encourage you as we give you these, these tools to think about that we also think about leadership as managers, leadership as staff and whatever your functional role might be um, so that you see yourself as arbiter of trust because that's what gives people the confidence to continue to come as your customers, gives your staff confidence to, to continue to perform at a very high level. And let's get started. So today, uh, in the second half of this, we'll look at strategic planning for risk mitigation. We will uh, first start with scenario analysis and then testing and implementation there are some other strategic considerations for business continuity. And then we want to return to this whole topic of business leadership uh, for continuity. So first of all, risk mitigation should be data-driven and address real business gaps. The data-driven approach must be aligned to milestones that can build trust and support business continuity. It's important to identify those areas Linda's laid, I think, a very good foundation for what I'm going to speak about today. And my presentation is actually a continuation of those excellent points, uh, but digging more granularly into some of the tools that you can use for scenario analysis and testing and implementation. Uh, rather than eliminate them, rather than uh, avoid them or just accept them, uh, I want to help you to really think about how do you reduce the impact of that risk? Because risk, as you know, in this environment, surely does exist. And we do that through strategy, policy, but also collective action. And it's important to decide what those milestones are in relationship to baseline numbers. And so scenario analysis um, is going to help us think about contingencies and focus on, you know, really what are the functional areas that are most at risk or the business lines that are most at risk? And then how do we go about analyzing? Well, let's get into that. Uh, let me just explain this table. It has a lot of information, but I promise you there is some method to the madness that you see on the screen. Uh, contingency planning cuts across functional areas and or business lines. So the rate, way to read that, we're going to look at three different areas, sales, staff, and supply chain. Uh, we use the first column to the left of that baseline metrics to really pay attention to and focus on what are the areas of that business where uh, data-driven analysis really should focus on. And then as you think about looking at those areas, how do you kind of think about analyzing them what, over what timeline and with what frequency? And then the, the tests, the key tests, 
are in that next row. And those numbers, one, two, three, four, correspond to those baseline metrics. And then the mitigants, what, what are the things you can do to re reduce and avoid the impact of those risks? And then uh, finally, implementation. We're going to take an institutionalization approach when we think about and talk about um, implementation. Uh, great. So first of all, let's uh, start with sales. Uh, one of the, I think, uh, great tools to use is what we call a margin analysis. These are largely accounting and, and financial terms. Uh, I'm sure quite a number of you are very familiar with them. They're simple techniques. So I won't go uh, through them on a blow-by-blow -blow basis, but right now we'll just focus very generally. Uh, margin analysis for efficiency in terms of sales, in terms of conversion of sales. And uh, secondly, a unit economics for cost per customer, and then accounts receivable management. What is the average collections period? Why is that important? Because if your sales do not meet the projections, then obviously that has implications for the financial stability and sustainability of your company. We recommend that you uh, project these out uh, three years, but I think they're dependent upon the level of this risk, and we'll give you a tool to look at how do you measure the level and rate the level of risk. It's really important to think about this in terms of the frequency, whether you do it monthly, weekly, or, or quarterly. And then uh, the test uh, for the margin analysis is in terms of looking at the operating uh, profit uh, versus over sales. That's uh, the margin, uh, the, the operating margin, sales margin is as we have indicated. And then unit economics is really important for understanding the driver of, of your cost and making sure that you're able to cover those. Cost of goods sold uh, over customers will give you unit economics for cost per customer. And then accounts receivable is the average account receivable over net sales times, times the number of days. Another tool you can use is the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis. And the mitigants in this case might be a shift or a, a refocus of the product line uh, or a targeted sales campaign to actually, uh, if you, after you do analysis, understand in terms of your sales channels, uh, the higher profit sales channel, maybe it's investing, spending more time going after that higher margin sales channel or buyer, if you will, uh, over another category of buyer. And then uh, thinking about the higher average cut, Average collections time could also require a change in terms, uh, in terms of the, the payback period, uh, adjusting the terms so, so that that smooths out uh, the frequency or the likelihood of payment. A standard sort of implementation recommendation we have is for a quarterly review of sales um, and the risk metrics and the test. And perhaps there's an a, a opportunity for an online survey for product satisfa satisfaction to determine some of the new approaches to marketing. And finally, monitoring and adjusting collections as needed in terms of tracking the industry as well as your company. I'm gonna quickly go through uh, key staff. I think that most managers have had to deal with this point uh, at this time in terms of making that decision of reduction um, or doubling down in terms of giving existing staff more responsibility, giving paid lead off, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, I think one way to do that, the first way, is what is the contribution uh, in terms of the, the overhead cost per department and the perceived value, the contribution of that particular department? Uh, how efficient are they in terms of sales, the revenue that comes in per employee for that department or for your business overall? And then the amount of, of turnover, the monthly exits over the monthly active staff. Why, why is that important? Uh, because that becomes a risky sort of functional group or business group if there's a lot of turnover. And then I think the, the rest of that is pretty self-explanatory. Let's go to the next slide. And then in terms of suppliers, this is something I think is of interest to all entrepreneurs and all managers. Uh, accounts payable, monthly delivery delay, supplier diversity. We're going to look at something called the supplier risk assessment tool. Um, again, I, we recommend that you, based upon how you assess that risk to align the time that's needed to in terms of the frequency and accounts payable trends looking at accounts payable turnover this looks like a complicated formula but it's actually pretty simple it's total supply purchases over the sum of uh, your beginning point accounts payable 
endpoint accounts payable over a given uh, period of time, and the average of that is just divided by two. For supplier diversity, um, I'm sorry, monthly de delivery delays, what is that number? And uh, how, how often and how is that impacting your business? Supplier diversity, the number of supplier options might be something that you want to consider if you feel that the terms are not as favorable to you or there are some problems with delivery of that supplier or your payment to that supplier, the terms uh, uh, might, be, might be able to be negotiated so they're less onerous to your business. And also, again, in terms of implementation, we give you some, some guidelines there. I'm gonna go down to the bottom and then we're gonna take a look at this supplier risk assessment tool. Uh, the important thing is to think about institutionalizing your risk and recovery strategy. So that includes deciding uh, what metrics you wanna use, the tools and the tests and implementation, uh, putting them into a data folder, but also combine that with a good outlook on economic forecasts in terms of not only your sector, but within the country and also within the region. And then there are some other trends that you should look at as well. It's important to have maybe a team to monitor that. Now let's look at this supplier risk index. I'm gonna go all the way to the last slide, which is in the appendix. And you can see very quickly, it's a tool. And at the bottom, you can actually access this online. There are a number of industry areas, I'm sorry, uh, areas of focus on the left that you should consider um, as the categories for assessment in terms of the risk associated with the with your supplier and then a suggested scorecard criteria the way this works is also the next column there's a rating that you assign uh, how you assign that risk uh, and then the weight is a combination of the supplier risk rating uh, and then the average rate that, that you assign to that in terms of how important it is and then the product of the the area weight and that rating gives you a weighted average I encourage you uh, to go through that. It's a pretty intuitive tool uh, to help you get a sense as to what the supplier risk is uh, for certain aspects uh, of that uh, business line. I'm gonna go now to the next area uh, and then thinking about some of the other considerations for mismitigation. First of all, uh, stakeholder management and reporting. Depending upon the size of your company, it really is important to have a designated team to assess some of the things that we've been talking about, it's different scenarios, testing and implementation, that becomes their, one of their tasks. Uh, and maybe depending upon the availability of your board and the interests, aligning them with at least one member of the board for mutual accountability to form a steering committee for recovery. And maybe along with that, that group can then publish or work on producing what we call a risk recovery report on a quarterly basis or as needed so that the, all of your stakeholders are informed, everyone is, um, is informed of what the risks are, but even more importantly, what the mitigation measures that your company is taking. Again, going back to the value-based leadership principle that we lifted up before we began, trust is emphasized, supported, and demonstrated in ways like these. You also might want to consider outsourcing and working with, in particular areas of risk, professional service firms. I'm sure all of you have thought about this in terms of, is it time for me to bring in a lawyer when it comes to HR management? If I'm a tech company, is there something related to intellectual property that I should keep in mind? Um, and maybe it's something that's uh, outside of my technical expertise, and there is a professional firm, a law firm that might be able to help us with this. And then depending upon the, what the risk might be as it relates to environmental risk, there are environmental, social, and governance consultants that can be hired. And it's also good to, uh, just in terms of uh, keeping uh, conflict of interest away, uh, to hire perhaps a firm that has no direct ties to the company or to the boards. The last topic, I'm a former M&A investment banker, and uh, I know that this is sometimes a sensitive issue to talk about a business continuity strategy as a divestiture. That means giving or uh, divesting or giving away the company, or in the case of a merger, combining the company with, an, with another one. I think diversification, appreciation, the value of the company, uh, IP acquisition are some of the reasons why you would think about that. And there are various strategies that, that go along with that. I'm gonna uh, move on to leadership.
And I think most of these points are pretty intuitive, but we cannot emphasize enough the importance of not only presenting a data-driven approach that is thorough, that is consistent, and it's clear, and that's, that's communicated, but at the same time, uh, to take on this leadership mantle in a new way to build trust among your various stakeholders, whether it's board, uh, shareholders, uh, most importantly, your staff members. And so a paradigm that we like that we adapted from George Bolden is Guy, Guy Bolden is uh, this one that you see on the screen now. Being a communicator sometimes, uh, you know, we think of that as the CEO, as being the boss person, that that comes naturally. But being authentic is another dimension of that communication um, requirement that often is overlooked or not taken as seriously. Being authentic is not just telling the truth, um, but can conveying that truth in a way that's sensitive to the context of the hearers. So that, that means communicating, uh, not just this is a business risk, uh, but these are the implications of it for our business potentially so that the entire team or department can, can also begin to do their own planning. I'm informing early and often, shepherding uh, your company through the priorities that it will have to face in a time of change, and empowering staff to be a part of that decision-making process. Oftentimes in hierarchical firms, that's not something that's well received, but we, we believe that it makes a difference in these times so that trust can be established between staff and management. Also being a, a connector, looking to be present with your team Zoom, WebEx, these are tools, but they don't really replace being present. As you all know, we all can be on a Zoom call and see each other, but not really be present in terms of how we communicate, how we connect, et cetera, and being empathetic. And last but not least, is looking to reaffirm the mission uh, periodically on a more frequent basis to rally uh, the morale of the company as you go through times of change as we are in now, uh, so that you can stay on mission and work to better and work a lot better collaboratively. Uh, we're almost done. This is the last slide I want to present. And part of that leadership also is understanding your culture may have to change now. As people are working from home, uh, as you go through this, this recovery process, it's really important that you have the right policies in place for data security, people working uh, offsite, checks and balances on, on remote work and create a culture where that's sort of celebrated and working from home or social distancing, uh, the new norm, as everyone is, is referring to it as, um, is embedded into your, co in, into your culture and the way you plan your meetings, your work, um, and your engagement with staff as well as with stakeholders. Thinking about decentralizing, obviously, if the economics of your business uh, require that because of cash constraints, you've already thought about this, but also in terms of um, being in line with COVID compliance uh, procedures at work, but also making it easier now for things to get done. Having uh, effective reporting protocols, effective timelines, but thinking about whether or not they need to be as detailed and as deep as they once were. And the last thing we do want to also offer you some operational policies to think about in the COVID-19 business context. We've given you a URL uh, for, for you to actually review those policies in your own time. Basically, it's a checklist. It's a checklist that allows you to ascertain how COVID ready your business is. I'm going to stop there. Uh, again, thank you so much for your time. If you want to reach out to VentureLift Africa, you can do so at simply Wilmot, my first name, at vlafrica.com. Thank you so much.